just getting more fit and in the process of exercising improves markers of things like depression, anxiety, gives you a better mood. I mean, if it was a pill, it'd be the most effective antidepressant anxiolytic pill ever invented. It's so effective. But there's two parts to this. There's a long-term effect with over time improving health, I get less depressed and less anxious. There's also the short acute effect. As soon as I exercise, I get these feel good chemicals and a boost in anabolic hormones. If I do it right, that la that come up and they last for, you know, for like the day and then they kind of go away. Right? So you get the long-term effect and the acute effect. Well, here's the beauty of doing a 20 minute workout every day. You get that little burst of those feel good chemicals and hormones every single day. You know what that encourages? A behavior. Yep. It encourages a good behavior because rather than going through this grueling, hard, painful workout, which I know some people can find pleasure in that. And that's an interest. You, you, you can develop that. But to the average person, that's a big hurdle. Like to the average person, when I would train the average person, one of the big hurdles was, I hate this. This sucks. This mm -hmm. is hard. Right. And so you have to get through that and whatever. And that's, there's, there's, there's definite value in that. But all I'm saying here is you don't even have to get over that hurdle. It's like, oh my God, I feel so good after this 20 minute, you know, three, four sets of that exercise. I want to do that again tomorrow. And then it starts your day off or maybe it ends your day or it breaks up your day. It's that kind of energy that just lasts throughout the rest of the day. Too. Yes. It's not like, cause I mean, this is where all the segments for all these energy drinks and everything come in. Cause that like midday lull, you yep. know, and it's like, we have this kind of bonk and crash like in our day and our work schedule. But, um, you know, if you interrupt that or you start the day with like good exercise and movement, your body just, just ready to go. And it wants to do more and be active. It's Here's a long-term consistency building hack. A little bit done every day is more effective than a lot done infrequently. So I want to talk a little bit about a way to build the habit of exercise or the behavior of exercise. Um, so there's been studies that have been coming out showing that working out a little bit every day is more effective than working out a lot uh, less frequently, even if the total volume is controlled for. In other words, same volume but the daily frequent doses seem to be more effective. Besides that, I think there's a more important factor than the one I'm touching on is those daily frequent exposures or behaviors tend to build consistency over time faster than the occasional longer you it's know, duration. It's easier to build habits out of that approach. It, it totally is. So it's like instead of doing like, you know, two you know, one hour workouts a day, you could do like 15 minutes or 20 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't do the math here, but let's just say they added up to the same amount of time. That daily exposure, that daily use tends to build a habit. And we've all experienced this. How many times have you to client hear, uh, heard a client say something like, oh man, I'm, I'm, you know, once I'm in the rhythm, it's hard to break it. Or then they go on vacation like, oh, it's hard right. to get back on back on track once I stopped, you know, type But of the deal. problem is, yeah, we always revert back to where we were instead of just like introducing these these smaller doses of that same um, type of stimulus, it's so much, it's, it's so much more of an effective approach just because of how uh, human behavior, we just, uh, the more we can like create opportunities where there's less big barriers to kind of jump over. It's like, we can just kind of reduce that a bit and then build off of that momentum that we start. Why, why do you think this is less obvious in the fitness space? Because when you think about that for anything else, that's kind of how we do it, right? Like you wouldn't learn a subject uh, where you go like, hey, you know, cram really hard for, you know, an hour or two hours straight. Uh, or you can every day read 10 to 15 minutes on right. the subject. Like I feel like we we know this in all other pursuits uh, when it comes to like knowledge or learning something. Like why – why or why is it not communicated that way in fitness? Why do you think that because is? Because yeah. I think, well, there's a couple of reasons, but, you know, even to touch on what you're saying, the pharmaceutical industry has known this for a long time. You know, there are medicines that you can take infrequently, like one pill a month or once a week. And pharmaceutical companies actually have to figure out how to make smaller daily doses because people are less consistent. They're more consistent when they can take something every day, like birth control, right? Birth control, the original birth, or I shouldn't say original, but some of the older birth controls actually had placebo pills in there because women were more likely to be consistent when they would take a pill every day. So instead of saying, don't take it for seven days, take one every day, seven of them are, are fake every week or whatever, right? So to what you're saying, Adam, I think it's because we falsely believe that the perceived challenge and intensity and sweat and pain, that, that perception is what makes the workout effective when it's not. Because 
if I do 20 minutes a day of exercise, that's 140 minutes of exercise a week. I could, I could do that in two workouts, right? I could do two, one hour and 10 minute, you know, hard workouts, or I could do 20 minutes a day. Um, and if everything's the same, theoretically, everything's the same, but the two, one hour and 10 minute workouts can feel harder. I'm going to sweat more. So I'm gonna leave thinking, oh, that was more effective. Now we actually have studies showing that not only is it not more effective, it actually might be more effective to do the smaller doses daily. But then when it comes to behavior building, like a little bit every day, you build, it happens much faster. You practice every yeah. single day. It becomes a part of your day. And it's also easier to find 20 minutes a day for most people than it is to find an hour and 10 minutes twice a week in their schedule. I think there's a lot of misconception when people get back into it that like it's going to, you're going to get there quicker by doing more and like extending the time you're there um, to, to be able to, to then um, get closer to your goal and get shed all this weight. And yeah. it's this like massive race to um, do as much as possible, you know, in a short amount of time as you can. It's like a harder, it's harder psychologically to kind of structure that and be consistent with like, I, you know, I think like it's, it's mainly a mental hurdle more than anything to get into that mindset. Yeah. I feel like we've glorified the, the martyr, Totally. Yeah, for so long. It's more to do with that. Like, it's just this idea of, like, the the more you punish yourself, the, the better it is, the more results that you're going to get. And so, obviously, if you only have 10 or 15 minutes, you're not going to really be able to punish yourself the same way that you, you could. You think it's less effective. You do. And yeah. you know it's funny? Okay, so, and to be honest, look, if you're trying to build stamina and endurance, yes, you're going to need to have, you're, you're going to need to do longer grueling workouts because you have to put, you have to get your body to the point where you're training endurance. Yep. But when we're talking about building strength, building muscle, speeding up your metabolism, which burns body fat more effectively. We've done a million podcasts on this, so I'm not going to get uh, too deep into that. You, that, that, that endurance factor, you don't need to work on that. Not what only, you need is the strength. Not, not only that, but a point that I want to add to that, it, that I, I not, the average person I don't think realizes is that Building muscle and burning body fat is a very, very slow process and 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 difficult, challenging. Uh, building stamina is really easy. Like you literally like where where your, your diet doesn't need to be in check the same way for building muscle or like the way you in order to build muscle and burn body fat, your your diet and your 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 calorie deficit or surplus has to be in check. That doesn't you don't necessarily need that for stamina. And you also your body adapts to cardiovascular training really quick. You can you can improve your VO2 max like in a week's time. Hmm. You're not going to go build a physique in one week of training. So the idea that we structure any of our training heavily focused in that area has always been odd to me. It's like I cannot train any cardiovascular training for weeks and then ramp it up in one week's time and make huge leaps and bounds on my stamina and endurance in one week's time. That's why when you see kids, when they play sports, they all have this hell week or a week before sports even start. Like they don't, right. you know, of course the coaches encourage train strength training and, and staying somewhat in shape through the year, but they literally wait. It's like, okay, we're getting ready to start to see that. And Justin knows he's going through this. It's like, they only give them a couple of weeks to really ramp up and you, and only normally like one real hard week focused on building that stamina endurance and then they're they're ready to play yeah. a game. So it's like you you can really attack that pretty quick, but when it comes to building muscle or sustaining a a, a physique that is low in body fat percentage, I mean that is more about consistency and discipline and programming. And it, yeah, and that speaks to the behavioral aspect that I think is well, so important. Look, here's the deal, like when when we're talking about the average person, the average person's interested in in getting leaner having a faster metabolism, right? Because that makes it easier to live a, a regular life because we're surrounded by food. Um, we're not active naturally. So a fast metabolism on its own is, is beneficial. We also have busy lifestyles and, 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 you know, it's, you have to actively try to be active. Uh, you, you don't just doesn't happen on accident, right? Um, it's harder to schedule an hour twice a week for people or three days a week for people than it is to do 20 or 30 minutes a day or 15 minutes a day, right? 15 minutes a day. Most people can find 15 to 20 minutes in a day, but the problem is you do a 15 or 20 minute workout. You don't leave the workout feeling like you killed yourself. Yeah. So there's a false perception. It's not as effective, but that's not true. Again, 20 minutes a day, every day is 140 minutes a week. It's equivalent in time and in volume. Okay. To two over one hour workouts a week, which most people won't do 
consistently as well. And then there's a sec there's other parts that I think are more important. The most important factor when it comes to consistency is can you develop this into a good relationship and can it become a, a lifelong behavior? It's easier when it's a small dose every day. Yeah. It also trains you and teaches you to build a good relationship with exercise because when you're doing a little every day, you start to, and you learn this over time, by the way, if you talk to somebody who's been working out consistently for 10 or 15 years, they'll tell you this. You learn over time on how to use exercise to improve the quality of your life, regardless of the context of your life. And this takes you a while to figure out, but at some point you figure out I'm more stressed. I'm more tired. Workouts are easier. I need more stress relief. Oh, I feel good. I can get after it. I could chase PRs. I have more energy. You know, I'm angry. So I work out this way. I'm sad. So I work out this way. You figure out how to make exercise improve the quality of your life. Well, when you do it every day, there's going to be days when you're a little more tired, days a little more energy. You know you're doing another workout tomorrow, so you're less likely to be like, this is the only workout I'm doing this week, so i got to beat myself up. You know, when you're doing two one-hour workouts a week, which is what we can ex what we can expect in terms of consistency if we do a damn good job with the average person, okay? I'm not talking about the crazy fitness fanatic. We'll get there in a second. But when you only know Mondays and Thursdays I work out, well, Monday comes around, I'm tired. Well, I got to get after it. I'm not working out again until Thursday. But if today's a 20-minute workout, uh, I'm tired. I'm going to work out a little. I'm going to make myself feel good today. And then tomorrow I got more energy. I'm going to go a little harder. And so you end up developing a better relationship with exercise in a shorter period of time. Whereas the other version takes a lot longer. You're more likely to stop and, and so on. Now for the fitness fanatics, we're like 20 minutes a day. That's 140 minutes of work a week. I like to work out way more than that. You could apply this 40 minutes a day. Do 40 minutes a day, which would be equivalent to like an hour, five days a week. 40 minutes a day, you'll get better physical results, okay? I've experimented with this. Adam's experimented with this. Your body actually responds better. You pick better exercises. You tend to train more appropriately. Strength builds really fast. Mm -hmm. It's a different feel, less pain, less joint pain. And it's also easier to be consistent. I'm, I'm going to challenge the whole, you know, fitness fanatic thing too. I think that is such a minority group. Totally. So to even speak to them is like, you know, what? okay, hey, listen, if you've been going for five years, an hour a day, every day or five days a week, I ain't talking to you. you know what I'm saying you got it figured out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not true. You're not you're not somebody I'm really concerned about. Like you have built this. If you're doing five years, you haven't really taken a break other than scheduled vacations and things intentionally that you train. You've already got a good you've you've already got got a great, relationship. Yeah, you've already built it. It's like brushing your teeth. Like, that's great. I'm talking to the majority where people are always off and on, you know, because even people I think yeah. that like, consider themselves fitness fanatics still have this off and on period. I mean, I, I actually feel I identify and relate more to that person than I do the, the persona that probably people thought I was when I, when we first started the show, because I was competing. I, I'm, I'm, I've always been, even as a trainer, I kind of ebb and flow in, in my training where I have a higher volume, lower. Like, I don't have this crazy, like, I never miss six days a week, one hour time, and I haven't had a break in 15 years. I don't have that. I mean, you're probably more like that than any of us. I'm more like, I identify more as a person who's like, listen, health and fitness is a priority in my life. I recognize how, how valuable it is. I recognize what a better husband I am. I recognize what a better father I am, what a better business partner I am. I, I feel better. Like I, so I recognize all those things, but I also love a lot of other shit. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of the shit gets in the way many times. And I get in these waves where it's like, I'm super consistent that I'm less consistent. So to me, like even people who would call themselves fitness fanatics, are you really, are you really somebody who never misses five days a week, an hour at a time forever like that? Or are you like a person who calls himself fitness fanatic because you can go on a kick for a hard few months and then you fall off. And I feel like there's more people in that category than there well, are the well, look, real fanatics. Look, 20 to 30 minutes a day, every day, is like doing three <clears throat> one-hour workouts a week. And I'm talking strength training. You can do a lot with three one-hour workouts a week. We've designed entire programs around this. But you may be thinking, I got an hour, three days a week. Like, it's hard. I miss it, you know, sometimes. Like, well, could you do 20 minutes yeah. every day? Well, Most people can find that time and uh, it's just more effective. And if you do a little every day, this is true. Look, I used to see this with clients. I would do this with clients to help them build better relationships with exercise. And it was so effective. I'd be like, you know what? Instead of scheduling an hour, what if I gave you two exercises you did every single day? Two, you know, two different exercises a day. And then they would do it. And then within like a, a, a month, they're like, oh my God, it's like part of my routine now. So By the way, I even like looking at it like that instead of minutes. 
So I'm currently yeah. doing mm-hmm. something like this right now. And I actually don't say, oh, I got, I need 15, 20 minutes. I like, I'm going to squat and incline press today. Like yeah. that's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's like, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do four sets of this one. Non-negotiables. And th- yeah. And there, three right. sets of this one. Like yeah. when, how I get it done. Like I'm not thinking time. I'm like, I just got to do those two exercises. Yep. And it's not a lot to commit to that, to do that every single day. And what I always feel is like, even one of those ones where I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. Like, dude, come on, four sets out of, I can go do that right now. And then I'll do the other three sets later on, whatever. And then I get in there and I'm like, oh, okay, this feels good. Yeah. And I knock it out. Yeah. I'll usually do that. But, um, to to the infrequency point like i have noticed too like if i get at least one focus like i'll, I'll do like a one exercise i'll do like 10 minute 10 15 minutes even uh some days like maybe that's all i do but the other days it extends and it just is a natural thing oh i get in the rhythm of it i tend to like do a longer workout as a result of that but you know the other days in between when it's like chaotic, all these things interrupted. At least I got that, which then helps me to build off of for the next couple. Of I, days. Yeah, I would say this is the biggest thing that has changed for me uh, in my journey is that I have given myself that the exact same thing, just that same flexibility and freedom to say that's okay. Where I didn't do that. But let me ask you a question. Okay, counting the total time that you're spending in the gym right now. If I took that total time and divided it up and, and made it only two or three workouts, so now you're in the gym a long time, would your results be better, worse, or the same? In other words, you're not trading results because you're. I think out I, a little I bit think it. it's respond. I'm responding better. That's yeah. that's the point yeah, I'm trying I to make. Think it's a better. Yeah, I, it's not a trade. It's not like oh, you know, I can't get the physique I want because I have to work out a little every day. No, no, no. You'll actually get both. You'll actually get better results, yeah. and mm-hmm. it's easier. To and there's consistent. a. I mean, there's probably a couple of reasons that I attribute to it right now. Well, what I noticed, I definitely. I don't waste my time with like little exercises hardly ever right now. It's like they're all the big movers because I know I'm only going to be in there. I'm only going to do a few sets. So I want to do the things that are the biggest bang. Whereas I I'm in there, if I'm in there for an hour, I have two or three exercises like that. And then I always have two or three that are, you know, and they're not bad. They're just, they're not big bang for your buck where it's like, if I'm only doing two exercises every day, they're always going to be big, big bang for your buck type of movements. And I think that's contributed. And it also limits me from, or it keeps me from like, cause I can get in this rhythm because I like the lift and I always tend to push the boundaries where it's just like, Hey, if I commit that I'm only doing four sets of this and three sets of this, I'm done. Even if I'm like, Oh man, I want to do more. I can lift more. It's yeah. like, no, I'm done. And I, and I feel good. I go back the rest of my day and I have energy. I don't feel exhausted. I don't get really, really sore from only doing that many sets. And so the next day it doesn't hinder my workout. So there's a little, yeah. there's some, there's multiple things that I, I see happening. Boom, the giveaway today, MAPS Aesthetic, the bodybuilding program that got Adam his pro card. I bet a lot of you didn't know he has an IFBB pro card. It's true, and this is the program he followed. Anyway, here's how you can win MAPS Aesthetic. Leave a comment below the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Uh, Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all of that, and then in the comment section, if we like your comment, we'll go in there and we'll tell you, hey, guess what? You won MAPS Aesthetic. Also, it's the final day for the August sale. MAPS Starter, the beginner strength training program, is 50% off. That'll be ending in 24 hours. And the Prime Bundle, which includes MAPS Prime and MAPS Prime Pro, which is good for correctional exercise and mobility, that bundle is 50% off, and that sale is also ending in 24 hours. So if you want to take advantage, click on the link at the top of the description below to get that 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. And we're talking, uh, you know, primarily here about strength training, building muscle, building your metabolism, all the stuff we like to talk about. Like the biggest enemy to strength building and power building is fatigue. Okay. You do plyometrics. The reason why people do plyometrics wrong is they don't rest long enough to exert enough power. Strength athletes will tell you every single time, look, you want to get stronger. You got to have the rest periods because you got to train that strength type energy, that cycle uh, that comes out. Right. Um, this encourages that because you don't have this long, grueling workout. They're short workouts. And so you're really just training strength each time, which translates to a lot of, for a lot of people into more muscle, a faster metabolism. And then there's another part you, you kind of touched on, Adam, is, okay, we know this for a fact, right? Uh, just getting more fit and, and the process of exercising improves markers of things like depression, anxiety, gives you a better mood. I mean, if it was a pill, it'd be the most effective antidepressant, anxiolytic pill ever invented. It's so effective. But there's two parts to this. There's a long-term effect with over time improving health. I get less depressed and less anxious. 
There's also the short acute effect. As soon as I exercise, I get these feel-good chemicals and a boost in anabolic hormones, if I do it right, that, la that come up and they last for, you know, for like the day and then they kind of go away, right? So you get the long-term effect and the acute effect. Well, here's the beauty of doing a 20-minute workout every day. You get that little burst of those feel-good chemicals and hormones every single day. You know what that encourages? A behavior. Yep. It encourages a good behavior because rather than going through this grueling, hard, painful workout, which I know some people can find pleasure in that, and that's an interest, you, you, you can develop that. But to the average person, that's a big hurdle. Like to the average person, when I would train the average person, one of the big hurdles was, I hate this. This sucks. This mm -hmm. is hard, right? And so you have to get through that and whatever. And that's, there's, there's, there's def definite value in that. But all I'm saying here is, you don't even have to get over that hurdle. It's like, oh my God, I feel so good after this 20 minute, you know, three, four sets of that exercise. I want to do that again tomorrow. And then it starts your day off or maybe it ends your day or it breaks up your day. It's that kind of energy that just lasts throughout the rest of the day. Too. Yes. It's not like, cause I mean, this is where all the segments for all these energy drinks and everything come in. Cause that like midday lull, you yep. know, and it's like, we have this kind of bonk and crash like in our day and our work schedule. But um, you know, if you interrupt that or you start the day with like good exercise and movement, your body just just ready to go and it wants to do more and be active. This is look, uh, this is trigger sessions and, and maps anabolic. This is one thing that people have talked about and that mm -hmm. I've noticed is that little you know burst of energy. It, it feels really good. And again, the 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 number one challenge what we're trying to work with here with the average person is can I develop a relationship with this that is not dysfunctional but also results in Lifelong consistency. Right. Like something I want to do forever. Because if you want to do it, you do it. If you don't, now you're going to play the, 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 you know, white knuckle game your whole life and it's going to be on. Well, it's such an easy way too for you to start. And then like, let's say one day you do aspire to be that guy or girl who loves to go to the gym five, six days a week, an hour at a time getting after it. And that's, and you've been doing that for five years. You aspire to get that way. The The secret is not, oh, I'm going to commit to that and I'm going to stick <laughs> to it. Right. The, the secret to that is actually doing that in very, very small increments over time till you build up to that. And starting with this like 15 to 20 minute, one or two exercises that I do every single day. And then like, man, I've been doing this for like a few months and I'm seeing all these great things. Like, oh, let me add a little bit more. Oh, yep. Let me add a little bit now, more. Now here's the part that I love to, that I really want to communicate because I, because I, I'm the fitness fanatic. And if I went back 10 years and I'm listening to this, I'd be like, whatever. I like, you know, I work out the way I work out. No big deal. I'll tell you what, if you're a fitness fanatic, try this, test this theory out. Okay. Pick one exercise. So I don't care what it is. Pick the exercise that you really want to get stronger in. Stop doing it in your regular workouts. Instead, if you go to the gym six days a week, practice that exercise for a few sets every time. So if you, let's say it's a squat or it's a bench press, instead of doing it on chest day, do your normal chest workout, take out the bench press. Don't do it on your chest day. Every day, do three sets of bench press, practice it every single day, and modulate the intensity because you're going to be doing it every day. Watch how fast you get stronger. That'll sell you right there. After the first month, when you had 10 pounds or 15 pounds to your bench press that was stuck forever because you're practicing it every day, you're going to quickly realize, holy cow, there's something to this. And the Soviets realized this, by the way. This is how they trained their Olympic athletes. It was lots and lots of frequent practice. And yes, the volume gets high when you get to the elite level, but that's okay. Start small. And then if you want to be, like Adam said, hardcore about it, yeah, you can get to the point where you train every the, single day. The secret times. to that tip that you just gave, because I do agree with it, is, and what will be most challenging for people is switching from the current mindset you're in right now to that mindset is a massive leap. And what it requires is checking the ego at the door yeah. and going, oh, I'm bench pressing every day now for three sets. And I can bench press. I normally work out five by five with 225. I can't do that. I'm not even going to work out 225 because I know I'm coming back every single day, starting myself significantly lower and allowing myself to build up in smaller increments over yeah. time. Because what ends up happening is somebody gets after that first workout and then they're really sore. And then the next day they're supposed to do bench again. And then that ends up hitting You got to modulate the intensity. If you yeah, do it this you got to bring it, bring it down. And I, I would encourage you if you take this advice and you try it, to go much lower than you think because you can always scale up. But if you if you dramatically overreach, you're not going to see the results that you're you're talking. So to about. give an example, and again, this is not for the average person, but for the elite, uh, more elite, advanced lifter. Let's say um, you could squat 315 for 10 reps, which would be failure. So that's like your max. Instead of squatting once a week with 315 for 10 reps, what you do is you put 315 on the bar and you do five reps. 
and you do that every day, even if the five reps gets super easy. Because what's going to happen is you're going to do five reps one day. Oh, that's easy. I know I could do 10. Next day, five reps. Next day, and you'll be like, oh my God, five reps is getting real easy. Stick to it. Stick to five reps every day for 30 days. And then after 30 days, test that 10 rep max. And guess what's going to happen? You'll get probably five more reps. You'll probably get up to 15 and blow your own mind. That's an old hack when it comes to strength building, but that's following along kind of what we're talking about. With well, this is what, what, this. what you're talking about right now is how the whole squat every day thing got so popular. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's the key. Like I, I remember we addressed that like years ago when, when we were first asked about it. Uh, yeah. Cause I, the forums were blowing up. I was like, Oh my God, I'm getting so strong. My legs yeah, are growing. Yeah. And you know, people were, and then you, then you had the other half of people that would say, Oh, that's a terrible idea. And that's a quick way to get hurt. And also that, and the secret is you have to modify the intensity. Yes. If yeah. you squat every single day, you can't squat the way you squat right now. If you only squat once one to three times a week, you can't take that same mindset and intensity into the workouts because you're doing it every single day. So it's more of like a practice. You're just trying to get really good at the movement, but after 30 days, it'll blow your mind if you stick to it. Oh, it's, it's, it's insane. Yeah. All right. Let's change gears a little bit. Um, do you guys, uh, well, it's, I don't know. Have you given Max, have you had him try any of our, our partners protein drinks yet? You ever given him a sip? Oh, my son. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, I think oh, Max will be here. Uh, so he has been introduced to a protein bar for the first time just the other day. So I don't know if I shared that on the podcast. I thought I talked to you guys about it. And I told you it was like he went bananas Candy. for that. And he eats uh, Magic Spoon like every day now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I knew that. So those are the two things he's done. So, so we started. So Aurelius, he's got this thing where if I'm eating something, even if it's the same thing he's eating, he wants mine. So mm -hmm. we have to do this thing at dinner where... And, and this worked for a while. It doesn't work anymore, but I'll take food off his plate and I'll pretend like I dip it in something in my plate and give it to him and then he wants it. But now he's realized like, no, I want dad's. So now it's like, instead of giving him food, I'll just have extra and then I'll give him off mine. But anyway, he does this with everything. It doesn't matter if I'm drinking water, if I'm trying, he wants to try everything. He's into mm -hmm. this thing, right? So I was mixing up uh, some Organifi protein um, in a shaker cup and he comes up to me and he does this like sip sound. It means he wants to try it. So he goes... So, bye -bye. <laughs> so I'm like, all right. So I gave him a little bit and the look on his face, like, like I had just given him it's like, like candy. Oh my God. He's, yeah. <gasps> and he does this little dance and he's super excited. So now anytime Jessica or I have a protein shake, we'll give him a little bit in his little sippy cup. Mm -hmm. And he is, so I have a video. So if you're watching this on YouTube, we'll put it up. He's visibly like we gave him, I don't know what we gave him. Like we gave him the greatest thing on earth. He's so <laughs> excited to have it. He loves it. So pass the baby taste test. Yeah. That's all I'm trying that to say. That was the Organifi. Yeah. Because yeah. I've tried some uh, different ones um, and some whey protein and whatnot. I uh, got Everett. He's really into like protein shakes now too. Because it's like always a thing with like trying to figure out like what protein sources we can, we can bring in. Yeah. Because it's like they're so drawn to carbohydrates and everything else. But uh, yeah, he really liked, uh, was it Legion's? I haven't tried Organifi's with them yet, but that's definitely something I'm going to so do next. So I mixed it with um, macadamia nut milk. Yeah. So, because I can't have dairy, right? Uh -huh. So we bought macadamia and I introduced, uh, Doug introduced macadamia nut milk to me. So good. It gives us such a nice mouthfeel. So Aurelius now walks around with. Little, so will you give him a serving or will you cut it in half or what would you oh, do? Oh, I don't give him a full serving. I mean, that's a lot of protein for a little, little baby. So yeah. I'll give him like, you know, I'll mix up like 50 grams for myself. He's probably getting like five or six grams worth of protein. So it's a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Enough for him to have in his little sippy cup. And Because I'm interested taste. in that because it's something that, um, uh, he to Justin's point, Max is obviously drawn to carbohydrates like crazy. So finding ways to creatively get protein. And I'm sure we're not alone as far as parenting. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's got to be one of the more challenging things is to how do I sneak, yes. yeah, how do I sneak protein into my kid's diet? And so I actually haven't even thought about making, I just made a shake the other day that he probably would have loved. So giving him some of that and seeing what he, seeing what he yeah, does. You can do it. that in like pancakes and all that too, right? So, like, we, oh, yeah, we, can make the so we make, we make blueberry protein pancakes for him. So that's one of his like staple. That's one of the ways we do it. And then yeah. Katrina has this, like, I forget what brand these waffles are, but they're high in protein and gluten-free that uh, she feeds him. So that's one of the ways that we kind of kick up the protein. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, I feel like a lot of, like when I look at his lunch pal, the snacks that are all packed, that's why I was like super excited that he started doing the Magic Spoon as a snack because it's at least high in protein because a lot of his other stuff is all like cracker type stuff. You yeah, know, it's just yeah. like all carbohydrates. Yeah, well, I mean, you know? we try to do it through food, obviously. Um, but man, yeah. if once you introduce a kid to something that they find like really palatable, yeah. that's all they want. Like, like we, Jessica made the mistake 
uh, I'll say mistake, but, uh, but she gave him, she bought these like waffles, these grain free, like, you know, quote unquote healthy, but they're still waffles. Right. And he had it. And that is it now. Now he comes down oh, and yeah. he says fuffle. He didn't say waffle. Fuffle, <sighs> fuffle, fuffle, fuffle. And we're like, ah, what do we do about yeah. this? But the yeah, protein, it's a treat. the protein I'm happy. I'm like, okay, fine. You can have a little, I mean, it's a lot, you know, I don't want to give him, you know, 10, 15 grand for a little guy. It's too much. So I give him just enough. And he sips on it, but again, he's just all excited about it. So it's, it's hilarious. I think it's wild when you see that. Um, and I always wonder, like, how many parents like even pay attention to that when they're feeding him. Because if he gets introduced to something that is even slightly sweet, I mean, like that, I gave him a bite of the protein bar, and it was like literally watching. Just, oh, it's like fireworks goes off in his brain. Yes, I mean, it was like, oh my! And now, if he sees it, if I'm eating here, like he's like, ah, he wants. Yeah. He does this thing where so this means more, right? Yeah, in yeah, sign yeah. language. So he'll do this, and he'll be like, share Max, share Max, share Max, and he'll keep saying that. He'll keep, <laughs> yeah. It's like, bro. Okay. Yeah, like crazy, dude. Like I've never even seen him do that. Like, he does that when he sees something like that. Yeah. Now it's wild. No, it really, it, it's so really. It's, you know, he's using more words now, but when he does sign, he'll like. To get my attention, he'll grab my face because if I'm like purposely like, <laughs> you know, like oh my god, he's gonna want to eat more of this or yeah. whatever, and I don't want to. He'll grab my yeah, face. I'm losing him. He'll get look at. Here. He'll look at me in the face. He'll make the serious look, and then he'll go. <laughs> like okay, you want some? I know, dude. You're hungry. <laughs> I'll hook you up, bro. Dude, we never even talked about your weekend, Adam. Like it looked like you're hanging out with dude, celebrities. What a like, cool what what a cool experience. What was I was at Concourse. So um, what is that? So it's the the most prestigious car show I think in the world. It for sure is in the United States because um, they come people come from all over the world oh, to wow. it. Um, you know, when you think of like your big names, like Jay Leno, Tim Allen, uh, Seinfeld, uh, that are all massive car collectors. Now is this all mm -hmm. can be any car or is there a particular genre? Okay. So the, so yes. And this whole month down in like my area over the, you know, uh, Monterey Peninsula area, mm -hmm. like there's shows and races and everything. I mean, there was a time I was getting, I was so mad at Katrina at one point cause I was driving and I'm like, of course, like a kid in a candy store looking at cars everywhere. And we're actually driving uh, on these back roads of our house. And people, they have car people lined up and cars are racing and stuff like that. And literally a Pagani and a Bugatti pull others. And not just like any Pagani or Bugatti, like a super, like you're talking about a $4 million and like $10 million car Jeez. are Ooh. driving on each side of me. And I'm like, grab your phone and record this right now. <laughs> and she's like kind of like looking around with that and they take off and stuff like that. I'm like, that'll never happen in our life again <laughs> where $10 million is driving next to us at one point. But it was like this all weekend. And so Concourse was the the actual main. So they had stuff every day. Like they'll have like a, a Ferrari day where all the Ferraris come in. And it's everything from the first cars, like from early 1900s all the way oh, up wow. to concept cars. So I don't know if you saw my story or anything like that, but you had like the crazy concept cars that we'll probably never see. They're all futuristic, like a spaceship that were open up. So everything you could think of is there and every company is representing like these cars. And then the big prestigious award though are the people that have these old cars that are like, you know, like Jay Leno and Seinfeld. Like Jay Leno, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Leno's collection. He's oh, like, yeah. yeah, he's got like steam-powered cars yes. and all kinds of crazy uh, yeah. ones that I've never seen. And I, I'm like a car enthusiast, but not to that level. Like I like I know like some of them and stuff like that, like the old Lincolns and everything like that. Yeah. And his, his is the... Uh, what is it? The Dubergs, Duenbergs. I always I mess oh, it yeah. up. Duesenberg. Uh, Duesenberg. Thank you, Doug. Uh -huh. Um, like, and there's a bunch of these out there. But you're like these people have like one of like a hundred was made, and they're like it's like the only one that still exists. Mm. You know, so there's a lot of mod. That's what most of these models that wow. win. You're talking about a car that was like from 1907 or 1915, and it's like w when they were made, there was one of 100. This is the only one left wow. on the on that's oh, in the world, right? So it's like you see all and every model since then is out there being represented, and then like people are. I mean, it's very like, and it's like a. Uh, and I'm glad we went down. So we went down to uh, the tap room, which is on uh, uh, where this is at Pebble Beach the, the night before. Got a chance to meet a waiter there. And it's like, hey, this is our first time coming down to Concourse. You know what to expect. And uh, Katrina asked, like, you know, what's like a tire like there? And he's like, oh, you cannot 
overdressed. It's very Kentucky Derby like. So all the girls have like the big hats oh, and wow. crazy dresses and jewelry and dudes are in like crazy colored suits and canes and like I mean it's like <laughs> over the top, but very very cool, man. It was a really really cool experience and I went with Jason, our buddy. Oh, that's where you guys went. Yeah, yeah. And it was like it was cool from the moment we got there because so we had tickets from him, which by, I didn't even know they were like $500 tickets just to get into this thing. And we went with a hit. He had them for free. So I got hooked up to even go. Right. So he, he gave Katrina and I tickets. We go down there. And because I talked to the guy the night before, he's like, yeah, just show up to the tap room. Say you have reservations and then they'll valet your car here. And I'm like, okay, cool. So we start heading that direction. And there's, I mean, it's crazy. Just imagine, Everybody coming here too, everybody who's not even in the show, everyone's driving their dope whips. Like everybody, every, it's like, I've never seen so many amazing, exotic, classic, everything type of cars, even just driving to the show. So you're in traffic and the car, it's a car show. It's a car show. It's <laughs> literally wow. a car show. Really Supercars. Yes. Really, really everywhere. Hanging out. Yes. Everywhere. And so we decided we're going to try and weasel our way in. Well, we got stopped like no you can't go in down there and, we, and i had mercucci who's like getting out there lying to the cops and everything about who we are and what we're doing <laughs> and we still couldn't right so we're getting down to flip around and this this uh old lady has a sign that says hundred dollars for parking and she's got a house that's like right before pebble Smart. beach Smart. so we whip in real quick and we're like how's this work and so he he's like yeah you know we'll, we'll park your car right here in our driveway they have enough room for probably park like 10 cars or like that and we just got lucky and so we got to park there and then we're getting ready to walk down, which was like a few blocks. And this guy was driving a golf cart for like, and he goes and picks up like handicapped people, but he had nobody in his, in his golf cart. And of course, Jason flagged him down, sweet talked to him and stuff like that. So the girls hop in, we all hop in this golf cart and uh, we're driving and Jason, of course, talking, talking them up and everything mm -hmm. like that. And they're hitting it off, hitting, hitting it off. And this dude, because he's like the, he has the ADA access drives us literally we don't even go through the gates no security no nothing pulls right on the lawn of the main event and just like drops like he's like hey you guys have tickets right and we're like yeah 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 we have tickets and we did so it was fine but we never showed anybody tickets or anything to get in he literally pulled us right on the main lawn of pebble beach and dropped us off like front row and <laughs> spent the day there and then the other thing that happened that was like oh shit what are we gonna do because uh there's four big restaurants that are on in pebble and when we got the when we went to the dinner on Friday, we asked him about it. And he goes, "Oh, you won't get any, you won't get in for food." And he goes, "So make sure a lot of people do picnics and bring their own stuff, because Ferrari, Bugatti, Lamborghini, they all rent the restaurants out for their their people, oh. so you can't even get access." So again, I have Jason with me who loves to like, we're like, let's figure, let's see if we could do this. Like, let's just try to weasel. I always say we're from Ferrari. I don't so know how that guy does it. <laughs> he's, I love him, dude. He's like my favorite. If you take him anywhere, you're going to yeah. get in. Dude, somehow. he's, yes. I don't I understand understand it. Yeah, we had uh, a moment like that when we were in Chicago and I was there with my buddies who were like huge. And so we pretended to be the Bears, right? Like, we got <laughs> into a few clubs at work, but like most people, dude, like, dude Jason, I don't know who you are. Jason is this guy. In fact, a little side note, my very first experience of hanging out with him was when I was 22 years old or something way back when when we first met and there was like 10 of us guys trying to get into nightclubs it's downtown san jose way back when and like lines of crazy and he went up and lied to the bouncers and told them that we were like this traveling baseball team <laughs> and he started introducing <laughs> us by position and everything that was my first experience with jason and we went in we got in right so like that's to give the audience kind of an idea he worked like, for just yeah. for everybody knows he worked for me for a couple years in the gym industry he has the you. he has i have never met anybody like him he, ha he has the greatest mouthpiece in the game like i of all our friends and yeah. you, like as far as like his ability so and I, now he's a, i mean now he's a grown man father he's a good father man, of three girls great man lots of integrity he knows how to use this skill pr properly <laughs> but when good. you meet him in his in, at 20 it's like you know it's like superman at 20 he oh, does it do what, he does know? it in this way that is like even when he's lying and he's doing it in a playful fun way that you forgive him for it like it, it's weird well, you know yeah. They know. Everybody yeah, it's, knows. Exactly. It's like they know too. It's just like they're enjoying watching him like tell Dude, the where's story. Where's he going to go with I, this? Yes. Yeah, and I it, can it. this guy keep this going? Like I heard him tell a story in the gym once about how he got a scar on his calf, which he got at riding his bike, but he told him how he was hunting boar in, <laughs> I don't remember where it was, South America. <laughs> 
And it was this like yeah. this like mythical boar, and he named it, he called it the Boratora Tuscalui or something like that. <laughs> now it, how it it gored him, and then he fought back. Anyway, he tells this whole story, yeah. and, and he does it so good. And it's, it's the mo- it's, it's everybody knows it's bullshit, but it's the most entertaining story of all time. He's got the scar to show it, and everybody loved it. And just, yeah. So what? we so we so we, again we try, and he's like, let's just go, we'll figure it out. So we you know leave the wives behind. Him and I go walking up. And we get stopped right away by like security. Let's see your wristbands. And we have, we had at this point now, we have these wristbands and they're like, those are not the right wristbands. You know, we have to have yeah. like the wristbands that for Ferrari or whatever to get in. I'm like, oh shit. I dropped my head. I'm like, fuck, what are we going to do? We've been in here for like four hours. We got to eat. Like, I don't want to leave yet. I don't want to stay here. It's a really cool event. And just then I hear Adam and I look up. Here comes the security dude, you know, clear earpiece in and everything like that got suited up, black, all black suit, little pin on him. We'll come walking up. He's like, hey, he's and and I recognize him. I know I've seen him before. And he's like, hey, hey, man, big fan of the show and stuff like that. We've met before. You know, Jason, I used to work with, and he, I was like, oh, so he was a trainer with Jason Piamonte, big fan of the show. Yeah. And he's like, what are you guys doing? I'm like, oh, man, we're trying to eat. I knew it was going to, he's like, oh, yeah, these places are all rented off. He's like, well, what do you got? Who do you have with you? And I'm like, oh, it's my buddy Jay, his wife, and then mine right over here. It's just us four. He's like, hold on. Walks over to the like back back door, like kitchen area to the place. There's another security guy standing there, says something to the dude, and then flags us over. We go walking in. We walk into the restaurant. Restaurant's packed. There's a the hostess at the front where there's like 10 people that are waiting to get a, a chair or a seat in there. Walks over, whispers something to the hostess. She kind of looks over at us, looks at us, and then goes over and clears the table off first. We sit down wow. and eat. I was like, oh, that was so nice. Mafia what a, style. What a fun experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was so, it you was know, so speaking great. of cars, did you see Dodge is coming out with the, they showed their, their, their Hellcat that's going to be fully electric that's coming out. They have a Hellcat that's going to be like It's going to be fully electric, and they made it so that it makes – because they. I read the article. Okay, guys like us, the thing we don't like about electric cars is you don't hear shit yeah. when you hit the accelerator. Which is like – I mean, that's a big thing that, um, you know, you get excited about that driving the car. It's yeah. like you want it to sound like a muscle car. You don't want it to just be like – Yeah, <laughs> even though it's no. going fast, right? Yeah. Well, apparently the way they designed it, with the way the air goes in and something else, it's going to have like this rumble. Oh, cool! So I think they're trying to make it like they know, like okay, we got. So I think who's done this the best so far that I'm aware of and I've seen is McLaren. So McLaren has cars that are both. So they have it's got the it's It's got the electric yeah, but no, it's not a hybrid. It's like it's using it's using both electric power and gas. So you get the sound of this, like, you know, V8 or V... I don't know if they have V12s in the McLaren or not. I know they for sure have V8s. V8, like, you know, turbocharged engine. engine, And then you also get the so you electric... Get the torque and acceleration of it, but then And then you get the top, the and you get the top, top end. Because one of the things... That, you know yeah. what sucks about all those electric cars is they're really quick zero to 60 yeah. or yeah. quarter mile. And then they, poof, they yeah. pitter out after that. Yep. So, like, still a gas-powered car. Well, if I'm not mistaken, this Dodge is going to be fully electric. But they designed it to have like a sound, like a rumble. So that's lame to me, though. That's it, like I know it's fake because it's like uh, if you see, you know that they do this in like um, your Civic Type R's and some of these cars put through the speakers. Yes, yeah. they run it through no, the speakers, so it's like an artificial sound. That just that's whack to but me. But also, I mean, I think too for pedestrians, like we need to think about this stuff too. Like I don't want, like I don't know how many times a stupid Prius has almost like run into me in the parking lot. Yeah, I have no idea it's there. Yeah, oh, here see, it is. That's there. it right there. That's the EV concept that is faster and louder than a Hellcat. I mean, it looks pretty cool. They, so, so they made they made it so that it makes it looks cool, right? So, so yeah. I got DMs from people that were asking me about some of the cars there. One car I didn't see that he that this guy DM me about and said the new. So pull up now oh, the yeah, bad, the yeah. Chevelle concept fifteen hundred horsepower Shut car. Shut your face right now. They're not making Chevelles again, are they? It's a concept. See. Look up, look up Chevelle fifteen hundred horsepower car. I didn't even know about it. He's like, did you That's get this? One of my I thought they were stopping cars. all production of like muscle cars. Like I had seen that. Like, uh, from I did Chevy and Ford. Well, you know that GM. I think GM and Ford are are totally shifting to fully electric. Yeah, like they're gonna be laying off by next of, year. Like yeah. fully. Yeah. yeah. So I, what does this mean did for you gas? Find it, Doug? I did. Can I'm, you pull I'm, it up? So yeah, can... I'm pulling it up now. Yeah. What What does this mean for gas powered cars? Is it gonna be like? Are they gonna be artifacts? <laughs> Or you yeah. classics, or you're gonna be driving them around and people are gonna, people are gonna you. shame you. Yeah. yeah, like if somebody yeah. drove by in a car that was running off of steam. Look at that Trans Am Worldwide and what? Wheels. What Chevrolet Chevelle with 1500 horsepower? 
Oh, I need to see more pictures. It actually yeah. kind of looks like a Chevelle. Oh, no, it looks sick, dude. Horsepower doesn't mean anything anymore. 1,500? I, you know, when we were kids, you guys remember when, when, when 200 and 300 horsepower was a lot? Yeah. Oh. They make minivans now with 300 horsepower? Know. That's well, I was I was thinking about that because when I was with in uh, my dad's like classic car, and it was like pulling, it was like about four hundred horsepower, which was a lot, you know, yeah. for like an old classic car. But you know, now we're driving in these cars that are like easily six hundreds, like the the minimum, yeah. you know, of, of anything that's souped up because it can handle it. You know, it can control all that. Well, bro, that crazy power. Four hundred horsepower in an old car. Doesn't feel the same. Bro, do you know what's crazy? Things so like, I, did, I did actually on at this event. I learned this. I didn't know this. So I thought like the the introduction of like the four hundred big that didn't come until I thought the six, late sixties, like the the Chevelles, the yeah. Camaros, all those cars. Introducing the crate motors. Nineteen twenties, the hot rod roadsters in the like late the mid twenties. I want to say like nineteen twenty five ish and stuff like that had like four hundred horsepower freaking in, in those little. Shut up. Yes. Wow. That's I, dangerous. Yeah. Can you imagine driving that? Oh my god! I'd be like a death box. You know, oh yeah. my! God. I've I've been. I mean, I've been in muscle cars. Like I've been in like you know late sixties, early seventies muscle cars with 350, 400, 500 horsepower. And then I've been in modern cars with 500, 600 horsepower. It doesn't feel the same. No. A muscle car, like you feel every horse. Oh no! If you yeah, compare, yeah. if you compare my Camaro to the Rover, it's and they're 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 almost equal in horsepower. Right. Okay. It's like. You need like I'm scared to drive my Camaro <laughs> all the way th down. Like I'll only you like don't I throw it, like throttle. I actually like cruise it in yeah. like I, the idle in the cam. It's like yeah. and they'll get on it, spin the tires a little bit here and there, maybe get a little sideways in a turn, like a little bit. But I'm not like on it all the way. Where yeah. dude, the Rover you can well because when put it, it idles, down all the way like to one sixty and drive it with shakes. two fingers, yeah. dude. Well, the horses yeah. probably yeah, you picture the horses; they look very different, right? In the in the Camaro, <laughs> they're angry, ah, unbridled. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah, no, it oh, feels it feels so unsafe yeah. to go fast in that Crazy. thing. Where and they, I mean, yeah, and you get you get better and better with these like real sports cars. I mean, the Rover's not even like a real sports car. If I, you put like a sports sports car yeah. that it's like sitting off the ground it's too crazy. Much. oh yeah it's you crazy. feel so controlled yeah. all right so yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna shift here and talk a little bit about um some interesting uh, some good news so um seed one of our partners right they keep getting talked about in articles and news articles uh because well first off discover magazine put them in two articles naming them one of the best probiotics for constipation one of the best probiotics for yeast infection and then, I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but Seed is on the forefront of uh, of some research. So I'm going to read this, this excerpt from an article that I that I saved. In, in, um, it says, they're in partnership with Axial Therapeutics to translate Caltech research. So there's this research in microbiome and how it affects the brain and our moods. So they're researching into probiotic innovations for neuropsychiatric health a branch of medicine that focuses on both neurology and psychiatry. So the program targets the microbiome gut brain axis for mental health, which is important because of its potential benefits to issues like anxiety, depression, and stress response. This is fascinating because we've connected the microbiome. We just don't know enough yet to really manipulate it quite well um, to change things, but we've connected it to depression, anxiety, to uh, paranoia, to schizophrenia, to autism, to multiple sclerosis. I mean, there's a connection there, and they think that through this research, you're going to figure out kind of ways to treat certain disorders through the microbiome, and Seed is a part of this research. Wow. Seed is one of those effort. companies that I'm so bummed that we we were just not in the position back then when we met them to invest in them because I remember when they first came to us and we were looking over all our stuff and what was, what was the name of the guy that we interviewed? I can't think of his name right oh, now. Oh, geez, not Sanjay. It was um, oh. start with an R. I cannot. I can't get. His, I can't get his name right now to roll off. He uh, and I remember looking over the team that they had working. I mean, the you best have, of the best. They have the best of the best in, in science world related to this. Roger. And, Raja, Raja, thank yeah. you. Listen, there's, there's no. I've used every probiotic that exists. There's, I've nothing compares. Everybody, to nothing I, compares. everybody I know that that are family members of mine that were on other probiotics and then have switched to seeds say the exact same thing. Yeah. yeah. If my gut's off and I yeah. take it that night, I wake up the next day, my gut's fine. 
fine every well, aren't time. they the one of the only ones to test it through like a legit like digestive yes. simulated track yes. yes which is like super fascinating but i mean even this area of science is so new still like yeah. they're one of the forefronts of uh you know microbiome and all that research that's yeah. why it's exciting when i that's what i mean by referring to the team being like if there is any breakthrough in this area they're going to be one of the companies that will be either one to break it or be first to market to be able to create something to support it. Yes. Speaking like, of which, remember that study I brought up about artificial sweeteners and um, how it may affect uh, the one you talked to Lane glucose tolerance. Yeah. Uh, and through the microbiome is what yeah, they yeah. think. So Lane got back to me. And oh, he, actually, he did. He did a post and he talked about the study. First off, the study was well done. It oh, did show some changes in glucose tolerance. Oh wow! But it was only a fourteen day study. Um, also they couldn't make it fully blind because the people could taste the difference. Like mm. if you're, and, and all of them were, were people who didn't use, um, artificial sweeteners. So they, they were able to find people who use no artificial sweeteners whatsoever. And, you know, look, I barely ever use artificial sweeteners. I can tell the difference between sugar and artificial sweetener. I can almost always tell. Yeah. So he says, look, the part of the challenge is it wasn't fully blind and maybe these people, because they they were the kind of people who stayed away from artificial sweeteners, know they they knew they tasted it, and there may be a stress response or uh, a behavioral response. Hmm. Nonetheless, and and so he's not saying it's the crappy study. He says there needs to be more research. He actually said it's a pretty good study, but nonetheless, I think this does highlight that artificial sweeteners are not inert, and I think that's what people t tend to believe. The people who promote them that oh, it's like it's like water. It's not. It you you perceive it number one. So that alone will tell you. There's something going on. Even perception itself can change how our bodies react. Mm -hmm. But two, we're observing changes in the body. We don't necessarily know if they're good or bad, but it's doing something. So it's not the same thing as having no calories and nothing. It's literally something. So it's not zero. It's not yeah. nothing. So, yeah, yeah. so that's, that's where well, I've been wanting to kind of figure out a way to bring this up that uh, <laughs> is appropriate, but it's like, uh, or, okay. So I, uh, my grandma had just passed and uh, we had a, a memorial and a service for her and everything. I, I got to actually go see her uh, in her last few days. And so it had good closure and all that kind of stuff. And we um, had a burial. And I haven't like been to like a funeral burial like this since like probably college. But uh, Oh, is this what you texted us? You want to tell us? I wanted okay, to tell I'm you guys to because it. it's like... It, <sighs> It's not supposed to be funny, right? Obviously, this is like a time for right. remembrance, mourning, all that yeah. kind of stuff, right? I mean, she lived a really good life, so and my grandma had a really good sense of humor, so I feel like I can tell this story. Yeah. Um, and uh, so my brother and I uh, were pallbearers for this, and so we were to bring the casket to the site and then lower it down and all that stuff. Um, and so we, we had... Um, kind of made our way over there and we're holding it uh, with a couple other guys. And this grave site was like, it was kind of dirt. It wasn't like grassy and like real, like upkept. It was like a little more on the, like the dirt side. So a uh, little more, um, let's just say less managed. Uh, and so we're like walking over, you know, holding the casket and kind of like going through the ceremony. And like, we go to drop it on top of this, over the grave site where the hole is and there's like these two like wood planks on both sides where you kind of rest it down and we stand on top of it and we're holding it and um and and i'm i'm looking down and my brother's holding it and then i step on top of it and all of a sudden like the the ground behind me started caving in oh and it went all the way down while you're holding the casket and there what? was a hole behind me so picture like you know this whatever, like you, you cut, you, um, shovel out for like, you know, six foot deep hole and then like the sides of it. So the side was like kind of not packed enough to where it like, Oh, so it's like it eroded, in. caved down, uh, into the site. And like, I saw, I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> like I freaked out. Cause my foot was back and my foot went down underneath the board. And so my leg actually went under like into the hole in the hole. Oh shit. And I almost fell, literally almost fell in the hole dude. <laughs> while you're holding the casket I was holding the casket my leg oh fell my God. and I almost fell in and I'm like oh and I caught my nobody was like saw it except for like some people that were like there like like my parents were like oh and um I and my brother was like trying to just stay there and hold it I'm like dude we gotta go and I like grab him and pulled him off 
And then after we stepped off, like more dirt caved underneath. And so we got out just in time, but I was just thinking, I was like, can you imagine, no. right? Like I fall in the hole, right? Where do you think the casket's going? Yeah. You know? And then, ah, ah. Like, <laughs> it was like something out of like a, a horribly wrong movie, like dark comedy. Are, the, are they, know? okay, this, so are the caskets like locked shut or if it falls, does it open? Oh, that's what I'm saying. Like, the, yeah, like it could open and be like, eh. Oh, that's what I'm thinking. Because if a <laughs> casket falls, that's terrible. Can you imagine? But I just couldn't imagine if it fell and yeah, it popped open. I don't think they lock. Do they lock? Yeah. They don't lock, do they? Oh, I don't think so. I, I think don't it was, know. I don't uh, think so. I think that would be open thing. a yeah. whole nother level. That's all. And, and that was all going through my mind. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I was like, dude, this is like the craziest. Like, it would be a crazy scene in a movie. Oh, my God. Right? Like a Ben Stiller movie or yeah, something. Yeah. I just saw that. And so, anyway, the whole service went on, off, you know, and everything was great. Well, how how clenched was your butthole? I was so, <laughs> dude, I, it threw me so off. I thought dude. you were tell like a eulogy story. Like somebody had some crazy ass eulogy that they told or whatever. Like that. That's what I thought. Dude, you were that would have been no. so terrible. I'm yeah. so glad you didn't fall. Yeah, <laughs> it would have been like the most epically horrible thing to happen to me. Oh. You know, I'd had like some <laughs> counseling after that. <laughs> some therapy was needed oh, after that. Wow. Yeah. So one dodge last a joke. Bullet. Grandma I was gonna, I was gonna on, say, on yeah, your... grandma had a sense of humor. One last she joke. Yeah, sense of humor. It would have been. Yeah, we would have. We would have laughed about it for sure. Like you know, after all that. But like, it was just one of those things. I was like, I, I, I was just like, wow. I could have literally fell like it was so close. My leg was under everything, dude. It was nuts. Wow, my yeah. gra my grandfather, who he's you know he's still alive. He's ninety one, but for the last I don't know eight years, nine years, he bought he paid for his own plot, which a lot of people do, right? They'll pay for their plot, them and their wife, so they have them. They can be together, type of deal. But he he put his picture there already and flowers, and so like occasionally, every once in a while. My grandma or one of my aunts will run into someone. I'll be like, oh, I saw your dad. You know, I didn't know he passed. I'll say, he's not dead. He's alive. He just, for some reason, he has his picture up there. So I go, what? what? I don't know why he does this. What? Dude. Yeah, dude. That's hilarious, dude. He's got his picture there. So, and there's been a couple funerals since. Well, we'll go, you know, burying other people. And every time my grandfather, he, he wants to take his grandsons over. This is where I'm going to be. You know, I'm not going to be here very long. Let's take our last picture. And he takes a last picture with us. We have five of these. And I'm like, no, no, come on, man. Like, it'd be so dark, dude, <laughs> yeah. all the time. I want you guys to carry me. And he's like, paints a whole story. You're going to fight over who's in the front, and you're going to want to tell the first speech. I'm like, don't talk about this. I don't want to hear all this. Dude, this is so funny because, or not funny, but this is crazy because this is what Katrina's going through this right now because her mom wants to handle her will. And, and Katrina's, she wants Katrina to be the one to ride it and kind of oversee all of it. And so they, yesterday, were working on it because they had been, she kept, po uh, Katrina kept saying, like, yeah, mom, I'll help you. I'll help you. I'll help you. Yeah. And she's been telling her that for a long time now. And she finally tied her down yesterday. I was like, you need to sit down and help me with this. I want to get it done so I don't have to worry about it. She's like, all right, all right, we'll do it today. And then I she saw I saw her yesterday when she came by the studio and picked me up. And you could tell she was like all emotional. I'm like, what's wrong with you? She's like, oh, and then she told me like that. Oh, I'm helping my mom out with this. And she's like, God, she's so fucking cynical and dark about things. She's, just, <laughs> she's like, I don't want, if I if I go out, I don't, do not resuscitate. I want you to pull the plug, which means, if and that includes like, even if they think I could come back, but if I've been under there for like, <laughs> she's like, and you're going to be the one who has to do it. About yeah. it. She's like, mom, I don't want to think about that. Well, you need to think about it because I don't want to, you know, don't, I don't want to be doing this. I don't want to be a vegetable. I don't want you. Know, she's telling her all oh, that. Oh, like man. That. Yeah. So poor Katrina's got to be oh, in, okay. in charge of all that stuff. Yeah. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> Uh. Hey, check this out. Uh, one of the big problems with eating a diet that's high in protein and fiber, digestive issues sometimes is a problem. You can actually supplement with digestive enzymes to help your body digest and assimilate these things, but not just any digestive enzymes. You want to get the ones that are designed for people who work out, people who eat a high protein, high fiber diet, people who care about their health and fitness, Masszymes. It's the best ones on the market. It's the company we work with. Take these with each meal and watch your digestion improve dramatically. Go check them out. Head over to masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S.com forward slash mind pump. And then use the code mind pump 10 for 10% off your order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Amber from Tennessee. Hey, Amber. How can we help you? Hi. Um, I'm really excited to be here. You guys, uh, I'm in the process of doing MAPS Aesthetic, and I'm on week 10. Um, it's the first program that I've actually gone the whole way through, and I've been super pleased with 
the program as a whole, I feel like I'm making a lot more progress with this than I have with other ones. Um, so the first couple of phases of it, I did really well. I saw progress. I was doing um, body scans. My body fat percentage was going down. Uh, lean body mass was going up. Definitely felt like I was building more muscle. But as soon as I hit the superset part, everything changed. My body fat percentage went up higher. Um, and I know supersets work differently. I don't know if that's normal. I don't feel like I've changed anything, but I definitely want to make sure that I'm continuing progress, doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I just wanted to see like, does that sound right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let me ask you a few questions just so I can better answer uh, you know, what you're, what you're asking, Amber. How many grams of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates are you eating and how many total calories you're eating uh, in both phase one, two, and now three? Okay, so I've been eating relatively the same form of meal. Um, calorie intake is a little different with me than it probably is with other folks that have a history of disordered eating. Okay. So tracking calories is a little bit different okay. for me personally. Okay. Um, I, I definitely make sure that I hit a certain amount of protein, but as far as actually tracking calories, that's not something that I do anymore. Yeah, no problem. And, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend you track now that I know that. Um, but the reason why I asked that is because Oftentimes, now there's two things that could be happening. So we'll start with the first one. Oftentimes when I have a client come to me and say, hey, I don't know what's happened. Everything's the same, but I'm gaining body fat. That means nothing. It's not the same. There's something has changed and it's usually their food intake. And it could be small changes that people just were just, look, I, if you ask me to estimate my, and I'm pretty aware, if you ask me to estimate my calories, proteins, fats, and carbs, I'll get close, but I guarantee I'll be off by 25% at least, at the very least. So that's one. Or the second one is this. It can be that the supersets just overtrain you. They're just too intense. It's too much. And when that happens, one of the side effects of that, especially in women, can be water retention. Water retention can be a side effect of too much stress on the body. And you tend to hold a little water, and it can make you feel a little bit fluffier. She's Ooh. getting she's getting DEXA scans though. She said, "Yeah, so it's, it's body fat percent." Yeah, I, yeah, but you know, de okay. I know they say it's super accurate and this and that, but no. I, cha look, here's the deal. It can be that it can be that you're gaining body fat from overtraining as well. You could be. So it, my, my, the point still stands. It, it's it's one or the other. It's it's either it's, you're you're not as you know as exact as you think you are, or it's too much intensity. It's for you. very unlikely due to the 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 um, supersets. Very, very unlikely. Right. I would especially, agree with you. Especially since she's tracking body fat and her body fat percentage has actually gone up. Do you know what's, how water much did it go up? Yeah. How much did it go up? So when you said water retention, I looked at it, I've got them right in front of me when I looked at it and they've gone up. Like the total body water percentage has gone up. Um, and I will tell you like supersets, I'm sure have a great like place in the world of fitness. They super suck. They are like, <laughs> they're so hard for me because like I'm pushing myself as hard as I can, but like they make me way more tired than I am or well, that I was even in the first couple of phases. Well, here's a, we just answered a question earlier today uh, that was, this could also pertain to this. Uh, one of the mistakes that people make when they go into phase two of performance or they go into supersets with is they try and carry the same mentality that they were training when they were training strength training, like phase one of one of our programs, which is like trying to lift as much as you can. So they go, OK, I'm going to try and lift as much as I can. And now I'm supersetting. It's like, no, different adaptation we're focusing on. We're looking for the pump and hypertrophy. So my recommendation there would be to dramatically reduce the weight dramatically reduce the weight which will make so, the intensity yeah. go down yes so it'll bring and which will dramatically bring the intensity down and not make you feel that way and you'll then get the the benefits of the pump and the what we're really trying to chase after in that phase so that's addressing that but i want to address more of the body fat percentage of what's going on right now because the likelihood that it has anything to do with you doing the the supersets is very very unlikely and it's more likely of something as simple as this is like Easily in phase one, and I'm just going to throw numbers out that are probably way off from where you're at, but just to, to, to make yeah. my point. Uh, phase one, when we first started training together, you were averaging 8,000 steps a day and burning roughly, you know, 2,500 calories and you were eating right around, right around there. 
you simply could be in phase three and now only averaging 7,500 steps a day and the body only burning 24 or 2,300 calories a day. And you're maybe eating one or 200 more calories than what you were, which is so insignificant and hard to pay attention to and tell. And that is enough for that to happen. It could literally be like, it could literally be that right there. And so the two things that would be my recommendation after after hearing this, one, do what I said with the weights, re dramatically reduce the weights. Uh, think less about pushing your body and trying to be strong in, on this phase and think more about pumping blood into the muscles, feeling the, the, the muscles and getting that out of the workout versus like really pushing the weight. Okay, so that focus there. And then the other thing I'd say is uh, cut back a little bit somewhere on the calories, just a little bit. And you don't need to actually, again, track and weigh or measure just something. If you eat very similar foods, uh, whether that be ri rice with your meat or something like that, and I would choose to go from like a carbohydrate and just reduce the serving size a little bit. Just I and even just eyeballing say, hey, you know what? I always eat this meal and it typically looks like this. I'm going to look at the carbohydrate and I'm just going to reduce it a tiny bit and be consistent with that for a while and then see what happens with your body. How, how much did the body fat go up percentage wise on the DEXA scan, by the way? Um, my body fat percentage from phase two to phase three went up like 3%. Okay. So 3% is within the margin of error also. Um, but okay. I, 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 and now here's, I, I need more, I have, I need more information too. Are you said you were getting stronger in phase one and phase two, right? You felt yeah, like you and felt I definitely good. have been seeing more muscle definition. Like, and when I say muscle definition, I mean like in the bathroom with the lights off, like I'm like, Hey, I have abs, right? Yeah. Like, I'm starting to see that. But like, ultimately, like, that's what I would love to do is like drop my body fat percentage because I want to have more muscle definition. Yeah. Okay. So are you feeling like fried and tired? Are you getting any joint aches and pains, anything like that? I'm not getting joint aches and pains, but definitely in the supersets. I mean, I for sure have been pushing myself as heavy as I can lift on supersets. Yeah. So that was definitely a good call out first off. Mm -hmm. um, but the second thing is like, as far as like tiredness, like when I get done, I feel white. And like, yeah. I worked out at four o'clock this morning and it's one o'clock my time right now. And I still feel like, just tired. Yeah. Um, Adam hit the nail on the head. You got to yeah. drop your weight and the intensity is too high. Drop the weight on everything. You should not feel dead after any workout. You should feel good. I don't care what phase you're in. You should feel good afterwards. So if it feels like too much, it's definitely too much. Dr I would go way back. Dramatically reduce the weight too. Yeah. Like wait, whatever you're thinking, go even lower for the superset. And because you can always go up, right? So go really, really light and just test one workout for me where you're like, this is so light, but that's okay. Adam's saying all I'm supposed to be doing is yes. think more about pumping blood into that muscle and feeling the muscle and being able to complete the reps. Like you definitely do not want to have a weight on there where you're like, shit, I can't even get to the reps I'm supposed to. Like that's way too heavy. Yeah. So go the way opposite into the spectrum, see how you feel, go even lighter than what you think, and then slowly try and increase the weights over time, but start really, really low. And I think that already will start to make you feel better yeah. for the workouts. Yeah, I agree. Give that a try. And then the leaning out part, um, you know, two things that we do since, again, I wouldn't want you really getting obsessed about food and macros and calories and stuff is, like I said, is maybe scale back a little bit on the portions with the carbohydrates, just eyeballing it. Just, you know what you probably scoop and eat or do. Yeah. Just go a little bit less than that. And then the other option, and you can do both of them, is uh, pick up walking. You know, walk, a, a make, make it a goal to after every meal, go for a nice 10 minute walk or something. Just add a little bit more walking into your day. Um, and, and see what those, the combination of cutting back a little bit on the carbohydrates, walking a little more, reducing the intensity on, on the, uh, supersets. And let's, I bet you, you're going to see some positive yeah. things. From you know, that. one of the side effects of, of overtraining is Amber, uh, increased cravings and appetite. Um, so it's very natural for somebody who's pushing their body too hard without realizing it to add an extra couple hundred calories, which spread out throughout the day, 200 calories. You wouldn't even, I mean, you wouldn't even notice unless you were weighing everything, which I don't think you should do. I definitely don't think you should do that. So I, yeah. that's probably that's probably what we're looking at. So I think just reducing the intensity, I think you'll start to see your body move back in that in that positive direction. And also keep in mind one more thing you said that I think is important, and Sal kind of touched on it, uh, and I just want to piggyback off of it, is that you, these things do have room for error, and there is a very good chance too 
that you're about the same. You haven't really gone up in body fat percentage and or maybe you even went down a tiny bit and you just didn't see that on the DEXA scan. And because you, you're saying things like you notice you're building muscle, you you're, you feel like you're looking better. So a lot of times with a client of mine, uh, that's one of the things I don't like about body fat testing all the time is that sometimes with that little bit of room for air. It messes with your head. Yeah, it can mess with the the psychology. You could actually be doing really well. I mean, uh, if you are, and and if you were a client of mine and you gave me that feedback, like, hey, Adam, you know, I, I'm starting to notice my shoulders coming out a little bit. And I, I saw an ab yesterday and like, you know, you're, if you're giving me that feedback and, and yet, and then I'm also getting this on the, the DEXA scan, I'm actually not going to worry too much about the DEXA scan. I might go, you know what, L let, let's wait till we DEXA scan again in another four weeks. And then what that report tells me, if it's, if it's continuing to go that direction, I'm a little worried. Like if it goes up now four or 5%, yeah. like then I might be adjusting things, but but what might happen is the next DEXA scan sees you see great results. Yeah, on. but the advice that we gave you, I want you to take that because you're saying you feel like crap afterwards. You're doing too much. That's yeah. a fact, 100%. You should not feel that way after a workout. Yeah, she already knew that, right? She said that was yeah. like, right away. You, that, if you to, that feels super helpful to me, like dropping the weight because that's definitely not something <laughs> that was on my radar yeah. for sure. Yeah, totally. you, you got it, Amber. I appreciate you calling in. Yeah, quick. One more thing before you guys jump off is would you guys recommend just trying to go back through the supersets again or start from the beginning of the program? Oh, like at this point, because I'm at the end. Oh, man. So should I like redo this phase or like at this point, just knowing what you know at this point? No, I think you should do a new program. I think you should okay. do either MAPS Anabolic or MAPS Performance. Okay. Yeah. Do you have either one of those? I don't. All right. I'll send those to you. Okay. Keep in mind though, because I, we just answered this question for somebody in mass performance, this exact point. So when you get to the phase two of that, people get hella gassed. And again, so just remember that when, there, when we, when we, when we move you in phases, there are phases and there are no, it's only almost always phase one of our programs. You are, your goal is to push the weight. So your mindset is right for phase one. But when you move into phase two and phase three, the mindset needs to switch shift. It's okay to okay. let go of the weights not being really heavy because yeah. it's a new adaptation and focus. And then when you get to get back to phase one again, you get to push the weights again. And yeah. that's your body will respond better than that. That versus always coming to every phase with this mindset of I want to lift the, as much weight as I can in this phase. No, that's not the focus now. Now the focus is form and technique, or now the focus is getting the pump. So that that really matters as you approach every program that we write. As you change phases, mindsets should change also. Awesome. Cool. Thank you guys so much. That's super helpful. All you right. got it, Amber. Thank you. I never heard of anybody refer to supersets as super sucks. Super sucks. Did she say but that? I, yeah, mm -hmm. she did. She's like, but they super suck. Well, yeah, they right. kind of do Courtney super hates suck. it too. But like, and too, I didn't really jump into this because it's kind of nuanced. But like, in terms of like energy and like your your intake before um, workouts, like she had to adjust a bit and and make sure that she got a little bit more calories and a little bit more carbs, you know, like an hour beforehand just to like, so supersets really would tax. Yeah. As well. and, and the reason why a hundred percent, I mean, that's a, that's a very good point. When you're doing that kind of workout, what you eat before makes more of a difference than if you're doing just like a pure strength workout. But yeah, I mean, that's why I asked her if she was tracking. The weights was on point though. Yeah. Nine out of 10 times when someone's like, everything is the same. It's not the same. No, yeah, everything no, is not no, the same. No, no, no. And, and you know, 200 calories a day. Easily. You know, that's easy. Easily. And, 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 and that's so easy to add up. And the step thing I said, that's why I brought the whole yeah. steps thing as it just for, obviously the numbers are probably way off, but the analogy of like, people don't even realize it. you could easily fluctuate a few thousand steps in a day is not is not that dramatic but it adds up over time yep. yeah. and if you're or if you're getting a little bit more calories stepping a little bit less we could see that difference i mean you could literally be making your salad with an extra you know let's say you eat two salads a day and you put an extra half a tablespoon yeah. in each one there's a hundred something calories right you just there just put nuts on top you know that's, that's it another yeah monster next caller is cole from north carolina cole what's happening how can we help you Hey guys, how you doing? Good, good. All right, so um, I'll just jump right into it. My question is, uh, so I'll give the question and then I'll give kind of background and a little bit of a caveat. So um, my question is, um, I, so I, like a year, not a year ago, sorry, about a month ago, Sal, you were saying how it'd be really cool to see somebody go through all the programs. Um, and I decided, you know, I really like you guys' program so far, and I'd like to do that. So, um, so that's kind of my goal moving forward, kind of a fitness goal of mine. Um, I'd like to see my body uh, transition through all the different types of uh, programs, and they all seem pretty interested, interesting to me. Um, 
So my question is, if you were to watch somebody go through these programs or follow somebody as they went through these programs, what would you track and why? What metrics would you track and why? And then uh, the caveat in the background is, um, so I'm transitioning out of the military. I've been in for about 10 years and, uh, and I'm getting out doing the entrepreneur life. And, uh, and I'm just, uh, I like through my time in the military, I've kind of built some, some bad relationships with, with food and, uh, body image issues and stuff like that. Um, and so like tracking calories, um, I have tracked my calories before and, uh, it's not put me in a very good headspace. I'd like to be in the future, be able to get back to that. Um, and, uh, but obviously that's, that's not a right now thing. Um, and so that's kind of the caveat is like, I understand tracking calories would probably be a good thing. Um, but kind of the caveat is, is like, how do I get back to that, um, outside of, you know, seeing my, seeing my therapist and, and stuff like that. That is a fun question right here. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you called in because we, I know Sal put that out there a while back and I would mm-hmm. love to, to talk to somebody as they go through this process. And there's actually a lot of things that you can pay attention to that has nothing to do with the tracking the food. Now, that being okay. said, um, there are, I mean, part of the benefits of going through the entire, all the, the list of programs is that ideally we would like to see a gain in lean body mass, reduction of body fat, like, so that would be up there. And if Me we, too. and if we're not tracking calories there, you have to know that that's an area where there could be some room for error and just accepting that like, Hey, uh, because of my past, I don't want to get like ridiculous about weighing measured food. Therefore, Of all the things I'm going to track and pay attention to, there is potential that the body fat percentage thing may not be the most perfect and ideal, and that's okay. The other things I'm looking at, I'm looking at strength, mobility, um, technique on on the the exercises that I'm doing, um, uh, range of motion in in an exercise, uh, stability. um, God, what else would you guys track? Posture. Yeah. Posture, yes. Those are all physical. I would also track, uh, you know, perceived exertion, um, enjoyment, Mm -hmm. how it's affecting the rest of your life, your sleep, your energy. So basically just like, is this, is this program making me, uh, am I seeing improvements in, in physical fitness and am I seeing improvements in the quality of my life? So those are, you know, general categories that, that encompass quite a few things. And as far as the diet is concerned, um, the first thing I would do is I would try to work on my relationship with food by, Tracking things like, um, you know, triggers, uh, what foods are triggers, what emotional states are triggers, um, what situations are triggers, right? right? Do I, if I go to swimming, is that something that tends to move me in a particular direction? So I have to take my shirt off or when I go to the gym, um, how do I feel before, during, and after meals? Am I eating distracted? Like I'd start with all that stuff first. And then when you feel like you're, you know, you've, if everything feels kind of comfortable and you don't feel super stressed out and you want to start tracking, I would track once a week. Just once okay. a week, I would say, here's what I want to hit. I want to hit this many grams of proteins, fats, and carbs. And then you can plan your meals and do it once a week. And then pay attention to how that affects your behaviors on that day and the days after. Sometimes people will track. They're fine on the day that they track. Afterwards, they find that they go way off because it feels like they're off all of a sudden. And then go from there. Track one day to two days to three days to you know five days and so on. But really, you got to be real honest with yourself during that process to be able to say, ah, this isn't working for me. I think I'm going to kind of pull back. And and I will say this. Like, here's the deal. I don't track. I I don't don't track. I almost never track. I'm not against tracking at all. I think it's a a very valuable tool. But I get my body fat down into the single digits all the time without tracking. Mm -hmm. But but just by simply watching myself, watching how I feel, and manipulating my food intake day by day based off of performance, how I feel body fat percentage, strength, and that kind of stuff. So that's just me. That's just how I do it. So it's totally possible, um, but a track, you know, tracking is valuable, but if it's something that doesn't work for you, it's not necessary. You can get a pretty fit, lean physique. I don't think you'll get on stage. You know, I'm, I don't think I could get down to 2 or 3% body fat without tracking, but I, I get myself down to 7 8% routinely without tracking. Uh, so I think the average person, you know, you can get to the point where you got a, a, you know, a six-pack at 10%. Without tracking, I think that's totally possible. Um, it's a little more challenging because it, it requires you to pay more attention, but it's totally possible. So that you know, that's that's where I go with that. Well, being the performance guy, I could geek out 
uh, completely with uh, a lot of these statistics, almost like you're creating a video game character with all of these bubbles that you're going to fill in terms of your strength, your stamina, uh, your power, output, uh, force production, grip strength, uh, lateral speed, you know, mobility in terms of range of motion, but stability and strength in that range of motion. Um, and you know, it just along, there's so many different ways to kind of look at, uh, what all these different programs would provide and they're all uniquely individual and different. And so, um, to, to see if you could see that there's an increase, even if it's a subtle increase in any one of these metrics would be pretty damn cool to watch. No, I, I'm this, I'm so fascinated with this question and I love that you're like kind of taking notes down all the things that we could track because, what it, why I think we all selfishly want someone to do this is because all of these, all the things that we combined have listed were taken in account when creating all these. Like yeah. the, the idea always was like, you know, at, when we were writing these programs and it's, it is what made the dynamic between the three of us together always writing is we have different perspectives on creating programs for people and we take into consideration all these different metrics that you would like to see this person progress. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I, and I think what I do is that the list that we just gave you that you just made, I would probably look at it like this where I would um, like maybe bubble score it. One being like terrible, five being perfect or yep. something like that. Yeah, good job. And then like <laughs> at the end of every program be like, man, as far as like th when I went to this program, like my sleep, and, you know, sex drive and all those things was amazing. And then I noticed my and my strength was amazing, mm -hmm. but I didn't notice uh, my stamina wasn't great, you know, or middle, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and kind of like. Yeah. And then, and then the, the, the more objective metrics, you could just put numbers, gain 10 pounds on my bench press or yeah. five pounds yeah. on my squat. Uh, Cole, how many of our programs do you own? I've got the RGB bundle. I, uh, so my wife is five and a half months postpartum. And so I decided like she wanted to get back in the gym. So I decided. Now would be a good time to do map starter and just kind of go as if I was a beginner. I've been training for like five years now uh, in in the weight room, but uh, um, but yeah. So I've got map starter, I've got the RGB bundle, and I've got maps prime. Um, and so I was going to do starter, then probably resistance, and then symmetry, and then do the RGB bundle. Um, and uh, and that's yeah, that's what I've got. All right. So, well, I tell you, I tell you, you what. Have, do you have resistance or symmetry yet? Did you buy that yet? I do not yet. Oh, so give them those. Yeah. Well, I, I was, we, we'll send you those. But I'll tell you what, Cole, cool. do this. If you're if you're serious about this and you track this and you send to us, you can email it to whoever was working with you. Kind okay. of weekly progress, uh, weekly oh, reports, even, even monthly, monthly. You know, monthly, I, yeah. I mean, well, you know, every month. But I mean, I want to see. I want to see yeah, it on yeah, the yeah, 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 week. No, I, I want a text I message say after you finish this <laughs> yeah. program. No, no, you yeah. just give us you a can, laundry list of what happened. You can send it yeah. every month, but I want to see that it's been tracked. You know, relatively, cool. you know, consistently on yeah, a weekly I, basis. Yeah. Send that to us, and then if it looks good, you know, we'll send you another program for free, and we can work through this whole all of them together. But you got to be consistent with them, and we got to see okay. some of this, All some right. of this tracking. So right. I'll, I'll, I'll put that out for you. This is not for everybody. Okay, so audience watching right now, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to get yeah. you out for your a bunch of emails now. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Well, yeah, no yeah. problem, Cole. Thanks for calling in, man. Yep. Right, one, more, one more thing. Thank you guys for everything you guys do. Um, I'm really happy. Uh, I really enjoy this this journey that we're going on, and uh, um, yeah, my 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 little beard here, and I hope to eventually <laughs> one day be able to uh, have a boudoir photographer take pictures of me and wow. increase my social that's media awesome. presence wow. so that's awesome so i hope you guys i yeah hope awesome. you guys have a wonderful day yeah. awesome man and congratulations too. on the baby by yeah, the way yeah, yeah. hey thank you very much take it easy Cole. You got tiny beards yeah. you guys yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got I'm yeah i'm glad i'm glad that uh he asked the question about um what to what metrics to track yeah. because it's good because it got us to go through all the different things you should pay attention to. Like some people pay attention yeah. to one or two metrics, but they don't pay attention to the rest. Um, and that can make it challenging because if you're just obsessed about right. one metric, you end up compromising sometimes. You're ignoring all your body signals yeah. is trying to tell you. And so if you can like actually chart that all out, totally. I right. keep that in mind. It'd be awesome. I love this and I'm so excited and I hope to God that he sticks to it and goes all the way through so we can really kind of sit back because it would be great feedback from us because we, because yeah. each program is going to have, like if you, if you take the bubble idea that I was saying of like one to five, yep. they, after every program, it should look a little different. And then hopefully at the end of all of it, we did a really good job. Yeah. 
of kind of like really helping in all areas. So overall, it looks like a five out of five in all categories that you've improved on totally. everything. And hopefully, if we did a good job of writing all these, but it'll be really neat to see uh, each one individually for him personally. That's, and I can't a, that's wait why to I said that. that definitely. Yeah. Our next caller is Manuel from California. Manuel, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for having me on the show. You got it. Yeah. Um, we got a question about foot placement. So I'll just go straight from the email. Um, NASM suggests that feet uh, be shoulder width apart, toes pointing forward, squats, deadlifts, etc. Uh, in your demos, though, for I got aesthetic hit and prime. You guys instruct to have the feet slightly outward. I was wondering if you can kind of shed some light on as the reason why you know be it glute activation, quad dominance, has hamstring activation. Um, what are you guys' thoughts behind that? Yeah, so NASM doesn't like people building too much muscle, so they tend to tell people. <laughs> that's really no, the that's not true. secret behind it all. <laughs> no, you know what's, you know, okay, so here's the deal. Um, they're both, they're both okay. Yeah, they're, they're both right. right. They're both yeah, right. They're, I mean, honestly. You should be able to do it from multiple foot positions. Yeah, I, I would, I would, you know, it, they're both okay is, they're, is the bottom Yeah, line. but let's see, I'll explain why it's that way in our programs because most people can have, very few people can actually do those movements with their toes pointing straight perfect. Mm-hmm. Just they they lack the mobility, they lack they they lack the control and strength there. Like so, it, with a slight outward turn, it kind of gives it opens the door for a lot more people. So that's why we teach it in that position. And it's not wrong. But yeah, it's and it's not wrong. It's not bad. Uh, but ideally, I I want to be able to do both, right? So I want to be able to squat with a very narrow stance and feet pointing straightward. I want to be able to do a wide open sumo and everything in between comfortably. And I think that we should all as humans train that way because in reality, like when you bit, when people get hurt, they always get hurt because they're barely out of this position that they're used to always training the same way all the time, and that that's all it took to tweak something. It doesn't have to be heavy. Or that explosive. It's yeah. just they're out of that normal range that they're always working in. So the way I look at it is like if my body ever moves in that range and if I look down at my feet or there are times when I sit on the toilet and one foot's a little out, one foot straight, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm sure. So I, I want to be strong in all those foot positions. And so both are technically right. Um, and, and of course there's also the side with, uh, everyone's, uh, anatomy is different. Yeah, Morphology is so, different. Yeah. So there's going to be a little bit of a range there for everybody. I think the main thing that I like as a trainer, I find myself having to address is people like to default to morphology. Like that's why their feet are like way open when there's like, Oh no, there's some issues that yep. we need to address there that if you can't get your feet straight at all, there might be some issues that we want to address. Well, and also too, if it's we're just stressing just foot pointed straight the whole time, a lot of times people like overcompensate to make that happen, which then, you know, there's there there's multiple things that they need to address in their hips and um, you know, further up the kinetic chain uh that uh that now they're compensating as a result just trying to perform it with with feet pointed straight so there's just you know a whole laundry list of of things that uh, everybody has so many individual needs and preferences this is just like you know one of those things we try to standardize but you can't necessarily yeah. nail it is this your first certification manual no actually i'm not certified at all i mean i went to mpti like back in 2015 but um i'm, I'm not certified i'm just following your guys's deal oh, okay. and i kind of do my own reading and stuff and kind of put my own stuff together and then i hear you know the information that you guys put out there, I really trust. And there's only two sources of information that I really trust. And you guys are one of them. Um, so I was just kind of like questioning things as all. Well. How did you, how did you know NASM does a feet for you're right. But how did you know that then if you're not certified, where'd you see that? So MDTI teaches the NAS, NASM curriculum. And uh, uh, just a couple weeks ago, while I'm do, I'm on day 65, we've you guys' aesthetic program. And I just kind of popped into my mind. So I was going back in the textbook and just reading, you know, foot placement and stuff. And I was like, hmm, I'm going to ask the guys and see what they yeah. think. You know, yeah. what's interesting about yeah. this is that if you do the, if you do a certification and you read the textbooks and then you go take a course with an instructor and then you ask them questions like this, what you're going to get is more, more nuanced answers because the instructors tend to be coaches if and trainers. They're, if they're good coach and trainer. Well, right. yeah, well, they tend to be, right? Because yeah, yeah. uh, I, I had this. I remember I had an instructor and I asked them questions. And he had been a coach for a long time. He goes, well, you know, this can happen, this can happen, and what you'll find with different people. But you don't see that in a textbook, right? Because a textbook tends to be very, you know, it's like um, it's like doctors when they look in an anatomy and they go perform surgery. Like you open somebody up, it don't look exactly like 
what it's supposed to look like in anatomy. I mean, you, I, I know this personal experience. I have a family member who got their appendix removed, and it was not where the appendix is supposed to be. And the doctor's like, oh, yeah, sometimes that happens. So, you know, it could be different from person to person. They're both right. But, yeah, you want your feet to be able to be in lots of different positions when you squat and it be comfortable with good stability and strength. That's ideal. NASM also, uh, as long as I, I have the, I have three of their certs, and w which I took a long time ago, so I don't know if it's changed since then. But for the law, as far as I know, they're still promoting uh, just squatting to ninety degrees too. Yeah, safety, right? Yeah. So, so they they don't even promote uh, deeper than than which is something that I would absolutely teach a client to to do. You know, I want them now. I wouldn't start them there if they can't. You know, without breakdown. But if I can get somebody to squat all the way ass to grass with no breakdown in in their in their joints at all or the movement, then I would absolutely uh, teach that. Totally, Manuel. Thanks for calling in, man. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you. You got it. All right. Yeah, I uh, I, I boy, I remember this you know, as an early trainer, you read something or you learn something and you're like, this is it. And then you encounter the client where that's not it. Mm. And then you're hard headed about it. No, no, no. This is what it says. <laughs> we got to yeah, do it I this know. way. And then you meet another client, another client, you're like, okay, hold on a second. This is way more individualized than I thought. And it blowing my mind how different it can be from person. to person. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's sort of the, the only way you can kind of uh, start learning is you have to look at something is sort of like, here's kind of the benchmark. Yep. Like here's the standard we're, we're trying to achieve. And then you start to realize, Oh my God, this is like almost unachievable for a lot of people. And like, how do we work our way in that direction, but work with uh, each person's individual needs? Well, I mean, it's the reason why, uh, and I know we've said this so many times on the show that the answer always is kind of depends. Like, mm -hmm. and that is all like anytime any trainer or Sponsored coach by depends. Yeah. It says, <laughs> says like, this is the, this is the way all the time. It's just like, well, you know, maybe the majority or most of the time or sometimes, but it always depends because there's going to be, there's, there's going to be this, such an individual variance with all this stuff like that. And so NSM is not wrong. I think you should, you should try and work towards a place where you can squat down with your toes completely straight. I mean, that's a good place and you should be able to do it super narrow mm -hmm. and super wide. And like, it, and if you can't, we should be working towards that. But I mean, there's going to be a little bit of variance in every person. Totally. Our next caller is Lisa from Michigan. Hey, Lisa, how can we help you? Hey, um, so I, I don't know if you guys read my, my email, but I'm, um, I'm, I'm retired law enforcement. I'm, I'm in a flight attendant now and I'm going to be 54 this year. And I'm finding this job is very, very challenging on, on my body and just a lot of the repetitive moves and just carrying the luggage and just the whole job in and of itself with the hours. And um, I've just been trying to do a different type of workout program. And I bought your TRX program. And I've been doing that for the uh, last couple of weeks um, in my hotel room. And I'm just kind of trying to get my body more in line with mobility and TRX before I go back to lifting weights again. And I just kind of feel like I don't really know what the TRX is doing for me. Uh, you know, I don't want to lose muscle, but I don't feel like I'm building muscle. I feel like it's more like a cardio routine. And I uh, just wanted to get a little bit of advice as to how I should... Um, move forward with what I'm going through right now with uh, my body, my job and, you know, hotel rooms, they're kind of sketchy. You never know if you're going to get a good hotel room. So I don't even always have access to weights, but just how can I incorporate the TRX into um, my routine? This is something I usually do in the hotel room. Um, should I add some dumbbells? Should I add a kettlebell? Should I add some bands? Uh, just any advice along that lines. And what can I really expect from your um, TRX program as far as uh, aesthetics. Yeah. So it's, so first off, it's, it's not a TRX program. It's a suspension trainer program. So TRX is a brand, oh, a suspension trainer. So it's like Kleenex or, or tissue, right? But anyway, it's called map suspension. So I was just trying to make sure we don't get sued. <laughs> yeah. That's the, that's the thing right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. No affiliation <laughs> here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But no, okay. Nonetheless, there's a couple things that you said in the question that you emailed us that I'd like to address. One of them is you feel like your body is really out of alignment and your digestion is really off. Okay. So uh, th those, those still stand, those are still accurate. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, they say it takes like a whole year for your um, body to get adjusted to flying. And there's going to be a lot of issues in that area. I mean, I'm still feeling it. It's been in it about a year and a half. I still feel it. I think the digestive enzymes have helped a lot and I've been going to add a probiotic. So 
it's still there, but it's definitely not as profound as it once was. But okay. yes, definitely still there. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if I would add anything. Now, what can you expect from MAP suspension? It's a strength training program. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just using a suspension trainer and body weight instead of dumbbells. Um, you, you should notice more strength, more muscle, better movement and mobility. But based off of what you're saying, the way you described your job about it kind of being demanding and repetitive motions and reading your email. Um, I think you're, I think you're overstressing your body mm -hmm. and I, I think adding anything to what you're doing physically is going to just make things worse. So if I were to add anything, it would be something restorative and recuperative. Either that's working on sleep or meditation or something that's more restorative, like walking, like walking or stretching, um, you know, maintaining, you know, sleep patterns is probably a big one for flight attendants because you're probably traveling to different parts of the country in the world. So, you right. know, you, you may be going to bed when the sun is up or, you know, or, or waking up when the sun is down, you know, or vice, you know, whatever. So those are the things I would focus on. And if your digestion is still not great, I would work with somebody, a functional medicine practitioner, like a really good one, will be able to address some root cause issues for you. And then when that gets solved, boom, all of a sudden you see your body start responding again. We have a forum um, on Facebook. It's free. It's called MP Holistic Health. So you, anybody can join it. Go on there. Dr. Cabral and his team answers questions, help people out. And then if you want to do further testing, you can do that. But I think that would be a good resource for someone like you. And I've trained flight attendants. I've trained pilots. And the demand on the body that the travel and the time change has cannot be understated. It has a tremendously stressful effect on the body. In fact, you can see in the data... Same thing with shift workers, reduced lifespan and increased risk of things like heart disease and cancers because it is a big stress on the body. So what you don't want to do is add more stress if that's the case. And I'm, 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 I'm going to guess right now, and I think I may be right, that that's probably the case. And so I would say let's, let's work with somebody that can look at the root issue, start with digestion. If digestion's off, everything's off. I would look at that first. Okay. Yeah, two things I just wanted to kind of touch on for the suspension training program. Um, and you mentioned it like you kind of got a cardiovascular feel from it. Um, there are ways to in intense intensify, um, you know, how you're how you're doing these exercises and, and to, to get closer to the anchor point at some points and also like really like stabilizing your body and holding uh, this really tight position all throughout your body uh, to be able to perform it is really demanding. Um, and to slow your cadence down, to really slow that tempo down and uh, make it more so of a, a strength exercise. So uh, if, if you're not doing that, and you're just kind of going through the reps of it and, and working your way through and not really paying attention to, is this really demanding enough for me? Uh, you can you can scale that by either coming closer or away from the anchor point. So I'm glad I'm so glad that Justin said this because right away when you mentioned this, it took me back to my Orange Theory days. So I had the opportunity to uh, train and teach Orange Theory classes for two years. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but part of the the training protocol is. 30 minutes, the, the people are doing cardio. The other 30 minutes, they're working in the weight room where we primarily use suspension trainers. And um, I we would go through what would be considered a strength block where we're doing like five reps or six reps. And what I'd constantly, so this what what you may be feeling or notice is uh, very, very common because I, this was more common than not, that I'd have to go over and tell people that were using the suspension trainers to slow down their tempo on the exercise, meaning like going from that exercise, that exercise, and that exercise, let your body rest and actually slow down the the rep that you're the the exercise. So let's say we're doing chest press and make it more challenging. Increase yeah. the the range of motion with it too. Yes. Slow it down. Make so make it challenging and hard. Slow it down. Go deeper into the press and then press. So versus this kind of like get it to an angle where it's easy enough for you to kind of pump it out and then do the next thing or wait and then do it again. I would tell them like, let's really try and make this difficult. And if you do that, you absolutely will get the strength and muscle building benefits from it. But if you do like a lot of my my clients did inside Orange Theory, where they're kind of just going through the motions, then you will get more of just the, the cardio aspect of it, just the heart rate elevating and a little bit of a sweat and burning calories, but you're not getting real muscle soreness or noticing muscle being built. And that's because of how we're using the suspension trainer. So definitely- Make it strength training. Yes. Yeah, I do play with the um, moving away from the 
the anchor. I do play with that, but you're right. I probably just go into the motions and I just need to get a little bit more mind body connection. So that's probably why, because I, I definitely sweat and my heart rate goes up, but I just don't feel my muscles um, at all. So I'm probably just need to uh, and, slow and, it. And if I'm giving it, so again, if you're a client of mine and, and we're like, we're going to go back to a suspension day. So let's say the, the program calls for, and I'm just going to use the chest one because I know it's in there, the chest press for 10 reps I'm actually even okay if you fail at eight. I'm going to tell you to position mm-hmm. your feet. If you do 10 right in front of me and you pump out 10 with good form easy, I'm like, no, no, no. Let's let's move your feet even further back. I want to see you like struggling to get that okay. 10 just because of where we're currently at, just to make sure I'm pushing you in the strength direction more. I would say even just to prescribe to you personally with this, I want you to hold two to three seconds at the bottom of each rep. So that, okay. that meaning you're overemphasizing the most difficult portion of the rep. So that way you get connected, you get that kind of grinding response that you need. Um, so it emulates more of a strength exercise. Love it. All right. Well, I appreciate it. So I'll definitely um, reevaluate how I'm doing it and go from there. But you thank you so much. And uh, I think I'm part of that group. So I'll just have to um, go in and ask a question. I think I've just been kind of reading on the post for the holistic. So thank you for that. Awesome. Thank you, All Lisa. Right. Thanks for calling in. Um, yeah, good advice, guys, with the with the the suspension trainer. I think the way that they've been used for so long, and she mentioned TRX, right? They they they've done a great job of partnering with lots of group exercise classes. Yeah, which are which they say they're strength classes, but they're all cardio classes. And so when people use suspension trainers, especially if they have any experience with them or have seen people using them, they don't treat them like weights. They don't treat them like strength. Even, I'll tell you right now, they're guilty of it. So they they launched their thing and they used to have TRX classes where they have all these, and it's all taught in a class time music form. Like circuit training. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And even if the even if their intent, it's just like Orange Theory, Orange Theory. So one of the things I really, uh, one of the things that drew to me there, aside from having a friend that owned the franchise, was when I looked at the programming, I was actually pretty impressed with their programming but the adherence to the programming was terrible mm. because they got music going and they give yeah. scores for calorie burn and stuff so it's like the they it almost seemed like there was two different people that was what that built that business you had like a, a very smart trainer mind that understood programming and knew how to cycle through phases yeah, and, and exercises the entertainment experience person. yes yeah. and then and they tried they tried to force them together and what they what they may not have considered was that the entertainment high energy thing was going to overshadow the good programming that was actually in there because nobody was adhering to it nobody Everybody was in this race, and so they're just going through the, the suspension trainer. And I'd watch it. I'd be like, I see what the program says on the TV. Like, oh, this is a this is a five by five block, yeah. and we're doing five by. But everybody's like, bang, bang, banging out the five, then over the dumbbell curls, yeah, and make it as hard as fast. Yeah, as possible. and yeah. It just turn it into a sweat game. This is just one of those things I like readily recognize because I can make some of those exercises insanely difficult yeah. and I just like and I would show my clients just little ways to tweak it and they'd, they'd be like oh my god and they wouldn't be able to do it it's it, it has that ability it's just uh, the intention of going into it and really it's 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 about the tempo of it and uh the range of motion well that's also why I love the thing so much because the it really can be for someone relatively new, a beginner, and be great to for super them, advanced. To super advanced. I mean, you can you can definitely progress those things. Mm-hmm. Like to your point, Justin, to make them, uh, you can bring a athletic, strong person. I can and, destroy people. Yeah, I'll, sure. I'll break you off with some straps yeah. <laughs> easily. <laughs> awesome. Look, if you like our show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out some of our free guides. They can help you with a lot of your fitness and health goals. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. The rules that apply to somebody who is going from, a man who's going from 20% body fat to 15%, the rules that apply to that person are the same as the the rules that go from 10% to 5%. The difference is everything that we talked about.